Hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Smith Pump's webinar on lift station controls and control features. Before we, uh, before we begin, a few housekeeping items we need to address. If you're dropped off for any reason during the webinar, please log back in. <clears throat> also, please utilize the Q&A feature on your screen to submit your questions as we will answer them towards the end of the presentation. Today's presenters are myself. My name is Christopher Burris. I'm Smith Pump's sales engineer for the West Texas Sales Territory. We also have Mike Bernard. He's with Specific Energy. And he is the vice president of business development. <clears throat> Today's agenda will have a brief introduction to Smith Pump Company, as well as an introduction to Smith Pump Company's panel control shop, as well as some modern control features, remote monitoring, and then Mike will discuss Pacific Energy's lift station guardian unit. And then we'll finish up with the question and answer session. <clears throat> so a brief look at Smith Pump. Smith Pump was started back in 1962 by Tom Smith. And today it is still a family owned company. <clears throat> Smith Pump employs roughly about 75 employees across four locations that handles most of Texas and all of Oklahoma. Waco is our manufacturing, or as our, our, our headquarters is Waco, located in Waco, our Waco facility, with additional locations in Fort Worth, Austin, and Houston. All manufacturing is out of Waco, and this includes our control panel shop. All locations include shop and field services, additionally with warehousing capabilities. In addition, our Fort Worth office houses our motor repair facility which can handle motors up to 250 horsepower. <clears throat> Some of our capabilities include a small bench repair for small volute style pumps, custom machining, manufacture of booster stations and package lift stations, field services, control panels, and of course, warehousing. Additionally, we, <clears throat> We design and manufacture custom vortex suppressors, discharge heads, column pipe, suction cans for vertical turbine pumps, large pump repairs, even condition assessments and analysis, all the way to raw water intake structures, as you can see here at this bottom picture, being lowered into one of our uh, local lakes. So now let's take a quick look at Smith Pump's panel shop. Smith Pump has built panels for quite a while, but back in 2010, a fully dedicated control panel shop was built. This facility is climate controlled and isolated from the rest of the manufacturing operations at Smith Pump. A short while after the shop was completed, it became UL 508A certified, along with our ISO 9001 certification in late 2012. Last year, 2020, we manufactured about 482 control panels through this facility, ranging from small fractional horsepower all the way up to our largest of, to date of 300 horsepower. In addition to manufacturing, Smith Pump also has field service crews available to troubleshoot and repair any issues that may pop up with, in the field. At this moment, let's take a short look at a video highlighting our panel shop and showing some features that we're gonna discuss just a little bit later. From here, let's look at a couple of our, or some of our standard features. Uh, as I said before, we handle a wide range of horsepowers. Uh, here's one of our popular two horsepower simplex grinder pump panels. Uh, of course, we handle single phase and three phase units uh, from simple simplex one pump operations all the way to four pump quadruplex units. <clears throat> 
standard enclosures, we have NEMA 3R painted steel all the way to NEMA 4X stainless steel and fiberglass, all with the option of an inner safety door. Uh, the inner door is, is standard on all of our 460 volt three phase panels for safety. <clears throat> Alarms range from high water alarm, seal fail, phase monitor, and even low water alarm yeah, if deemed necessary. Motor starters are standard IEC, but can, can easily be upgraded to NEMA rated. Main disconnects can be mounted on that outer enclosure or on the inner door if necessary or if available. <clears throat> a recommended option is elapsed time meters. This inexpensive option can give you insight to uh, the status of your pumps. Uh, irregular run times between two or more pumps could point to a pump that may be in need, in, in need of refurbishment or a, to address some kind of underlying issue. Also, a lightning arresters. This is a good option in, in to protect your panel and your pumps in the event of a power surge. And then finally, any kind of telemetry can be added for any kind of remote monitoring that may, may be needed. <clears throat> From here, let's look at some modern control options. So the traditional lift stations these days utilize float switches. So your, your standard duplex system is the four float system with your bottom float is off, then lead, lag, and then alarm. But the biggest issue with floats are they are prone to problems with uh, buildup of fats, oils, and grease, or commonly called fog. In addition, turbulence. Turbulence can twist up your power cords, tangle them up, and, and maybe even knock off a float switch or a uh, weight on the float. Uh, once you lose the weight, it's just rendered that float useless. So as you can see in this picture on the right, uh, it's a station, the floats are all covered in, 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 in grease and the cables are tangled. So an option that we have is the fog rod. Seen here, it's just the one rod, cleans up all the tangled wires and, and, and just makes a nice installation. <clears throat> So the fog rod is a simple rod with 10 evenly spaced contacts. Each one of these contacts acts like a potential float switch. <clears throat> All you do is pick which contact you need or want for on, lead, lag, and alarm in the LIT controller, as you can see here in the middle of the screen. So as you see, the fog rod is here hanging off of its mounting bracket, and the black rings you see are the contacts. Each, contacts, each contact has its own color-coordinated wire that is hooked up into its corresponding color-coordinated terminal block in the LIT, as you can see here on the bottom. From there, you use the top terminals, which are labeled 1 through 10, to determine which one of the contacts you would like for the off-lead, lag, and alarm settings. Since there are no moving parts, there is nothing to get tangled up. <clears throat> But eventually, grease may build up on the fog rod and cover a contact. If this happens and the water level continues to rise beyond that contact, once it hits the next contact in line, the LIT will sense it and go on and run the pump in its normal cycle. But additionally, it will send an alarm or alert to the controller telling that the fog rod needs to be cleaned. <clears throat> to clean the fog rod, you simply pull it through its mounting bracket and squeegee it clean then reinstall. The fog rod is available in three lengths, three, five, and seven and a half foot. If additional lengths are needed, then multiple fog rods can be used in conjunction with one LIT to gain the additional length. Example, two five foots to make a 10 foot. Now we're gonna watch two short videos highlighting the fog rod and the LIT. Hi, I'm Steve Carson and I want to show you the fog rod. So this is the fog rod, and this unit here is the control panel unit called the LIT, and together these make a wastewater level sensor for lift stations. So, how's the fog rod work? What's it made of? Well, it's basically constructed out of PVC, and uh, I'll zoom, on it, zoom in on it um, a little bit later so people can see it close up. But basically down the length of the fog rod, we have 10 metal contacts offset from each other to minimize any issues with ragging. And um, each of these metal contacts is connected internally to one core of 
tank or cable. And the cable is pulled up through the conduit, connected up to the control panel unit, and that control panel unit puts a few volts onto, uh, onto each terminal. So we have a few volts on each one of these metal contacts. And uh, when a metal contact's underwater, then current will flow through the, through the wastewater, through the concrete and steel of the wet well, back into the control panel ground, and back into the LIT, completing the circuit. And when a metal contact's in fresh air, fresh air is an insulator, no current will flow. So extremely simple, just like turning on the light bulb, but the water's the light switch. Nice advantage of conductivity, when the level drops off the bottom of the fog rod, then you've got a fresh air gap. No way to get a false on signal once the, uh, the level's dropped off the bottom of the rod. So, that's the fog rod. It's got no moving parts, it's got no electronics, it's got no sensors, so it's very tough. And we give it a 10 year warranty. So now we've zoomed in on the LIT, and I'm just going to briefly explain it in the first part of this um, video. So uh, the unit itself is in a demo case, so we can simulate issues and problems. It's powered off 12 or 24 volts DC. Uh, we have a ground connection, which is the current return, so that's wired to the control panel ground. The fog rod cable comes in through the bottom, color-coded wires into color-coded terminals, and we'll wire four of these relays. Here's an example installation. You can see that Relay 1, Relay 4, Relay 6, and Relay 8 are wired for off, lead, lag, and alarm. And they're just wired into the, uh, the four spots where the, uh, the four floats were wired before. That's all we had to do to replace floats. There's an analog output, so we can use it to replace a transducer. And we can also use this for uh, telemetry for remote level. So this is a brief summary of the fog rod. Thanks very much for watching. <clears throat> From here, we'll look at another unit similar to the fog rod, uh, but kind of this next step up. It's a liquid level controller from Timemark. In lieu of a rod with contacts, this unit utilizes a pressure transducer for level control. <clears throat> As with the fog rod, there are preset points that are created for the off lead, lag, and alarm settings. This controller allows for quick changes to the set points, and due to the use of the pressure transducer, it is very accurate. From here, we have a current sensing relay, or an app monitor. Basically, this monitors your apps and senses any changes. Uh, and once they create or reach a certain point, this relay will actually shut down the pump and send an alarm. An example could be if you have a busted force main and the pump is over pumping and pumping running off the end of its curve uh, and therefore pulling more amps. This relay will shut down the pump before any damage uh, occurs to it. <clears throat> In the past, when three phase power was required due to horsepower requirements or just due to uh, preference, but only single phase was available, a phase converter, converter like the rotary phase converter you see here was needed. Today, it all can be accomplished with a variable frequency drive or a VFD. A VFD can be integrated into the pump's control panel if there's enough space, or it can be mounted in its own separate enclosure. A VFD is a very effective and clean way to get three phase power out of single phase. And due to this, VFDs are becoming more and more common uh, these days on uh, lift station applications. <clears throat> But a word of warning, with that being said, you have to be very, very careful running a VFD on a sewage application, uh, especially if you're running at reduced speeds. So the velocity through a sewage pump is key to it not clogging, <clears throat> especially on small pumps, your, your three, your four, and your six inch pumps. When these pumps were sized for that particular application, uh, the velocity was taken into account uh, but when that pump is reduced, uh, speed is reduced, then that velocity in turn will, will slow down and then clogging probability increases. Additionally, reduced speed applications or reducing the speed is not recommended for any type of pump that has cutting features or for grinder pumps. 
So with VFDs, especially if they're integrated into the pump control panel, uh, VFDs are known to create a lot of excessive heat. Therefore, an air conditioner may be needed to combat this. As seen here, this panel, uh, a heat load calculation was performed and it was determined that for additional cooling, a VFD was, or a, a, a air conditioner was needed and, and provided on this panel. So in addition to components in the panel, programming can be a modern feature as well. An example of that is a snoring and scoring program or feature. So in a snoring cycle, <clears throat> excuse me. So in a snoring cycle, either once a day or once weekly, whatever the, uh, the period needs to be, the wet well is allowed to raise, the level is allowed to raise all the way to the alarm level. Then both pumps are called for. The well is pumped all the way down until the pumps break suction. Doing this creates the most maximum velocity within that wet well, therefore giving the pumps the best chance of removing any solids, grease, any buildup that would not normally be removed under normal cycles. In addition to this wet well cleaning, with both pumps running, the force main sees its highest velocities with both pumps running. Therefore, you get a scouring effect, and thus cleaning out your, uh, your force main. So this programming basically kills two birds with one stone. <clears throat> Another feature could be de a deragging feature. So this is basically your amps are monitored on your pumps. And when it starts to see more amps are being pulled, that therefore could be the sign of the pump trying to clog. So that pump would be then therefore shut down and revert, ran in reverse, trying to eliminate that clog. After a set amount of time, the pump will be uh, returned to its normal operation and hopefully the clog had been removed and it can pump on during its normal cycle. If not, it will do the deragging cycle again several times and trying to get rid of the clog. And if it, after a certain number of times, if it doesn't eliminate the clog, it's shut down and alarm is sent. <clears throat> Moving along to remote monitoring. Historically, Remote monitoring was accomplished via a model dialer, like this picture shown here. Though a very effective way for remote monitoring, a dedicated landline was needed and all you would receive would be a phone call. Nowadays, remote monitoring via cellular monitoring is, can accomplish the same task and a lot more. One of these systems is from OmniSite. So OmniSite, the way it works is your alarm, your control panel is gonna sense an alarm and send it to whatever OmniSite monitor you have. From there, OmniSite via cell tower will send that across the internet to their web interface. From there, that web interface will send out an email, text message, or a phone call to a preset call list. <clears throat> so OmniSite's units, the basic unit for OmniSite is the Omni Beacon. This simple unit looks like an ordinary alarm light on a lift station control panel. Mounts are pretty similarly as well. But in addition to a visible alarm, it also can monitor two set points, one being power failure and the other one, uh, any additional dry contact that you have. Generally, you use the high water alarm. But this simple unit will satisfy the TCEQ requirement for remote monitoring. <clears throat> Moving along, we come to the XR50. The XR50 is the next step up. It can either be mounted in its own separate enclosure or if room uh, allows, can be mounted within the control panel itself. So like the Omni Beacon only monitor two set points, the Om XR50 can monitor 10, up to 10 inputs. And with the correct setup, pump run times, gallons per minute, and even pump cycles can be monitored as well. Then finally, we have the crystal ball unit. Though very similar to the XR50, the crystal ball can monitor up to 14 digital inputs, as well as four analog four to 20 milliamp signals. Therefore, you can monitor uh, amps, uh, level transmitters as well. And though rarely used, the crystal ball can actually function as a backup pump controller if deemed necessary. 
<clears throat> so here's an example of guard, the guard dog, Omnisite's guard dog web interface. This here's the recipient library. This is where you build your call list. So you enter your contacts here and, and their preferred method of, of correspondence, whether it be text, the email, or phone. You enter this in, and this is the list that it will call whenever you have an alarm. <clears throat> Here we see kind of Omnisite's dashboard, if you will. Uh, here's an example. You have all these lift stations at this certain customer. It shows the status of the station. These appear to be all be an alarm. Uh, when they went into alarm, have they been acknowledged and when? So all alarms are instantaneous. They are relayed in real time. Other reporting such as, you know, your flow calculations, your level of your wet wells, that is reported every 24 hours with their standard service. That can be e upgraded to every 15 minutes with a service upgrade. But if reporting in real time is what you is preferred, then Samsara is the way to go. Sam the Samsara IG41 is connected to the pump controls and monitors pump operation, wet well, station, everything. And from there, via their cloud-based software, it collects and reports in real time to a customizable KPI dashboard on your smartphone or computer. And this would be kind of the next step up from the Omni side. So from here, I'd like to turn it over to Mike Bernard with Specific Energy so he can discuss their lift station guardian unit. Thanks so much, Christopher. I'm uh, gonna go ahead and switch over from your screen to mine. All right, hopefully you guys are seeing my screen change now. It's great to be with you here again. I uh, did a webinar with Smith Pump a couple of months ago, I guess, uh, but we've um, wanted to talk specifically about one of our different products, the Lift Station Guardian. Just a little bit about us first. Uh, our company is Texan by nature, by founding. Uh, we were founded in 2010 in Georgetown, Texas. We've spread out a bunch since then. Uh, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, or just north of Nashville. We've got uh, a guy in New Jersey and in London right now, and a lot of installations, over 100 installations of our various products all over the country and a lot of interest abroad as well. And we're not exactly spring chickens anymore. We've got all coming up on two and a half million hours of proven run time out in the field. So everything I'm going to show you today is uh, already been fully deployed uh, and quite a bit of it in Texas. If you sat through one of the presentations that I gave on our dynamic pump optimizer, hopefully you remember this graphic because we all understand how cars work and how our tachometer works. And from a very early age when we started driving, hopefully you were taught not to redline your car because it's bad for it. And uh, we know intuitively that when we run our cars above the red line, bad things happen. First of all, fuel efficiency plummets, but more importantly, so also does mechanical reliability. And so you don't wanna do this hardly ever. Unfortunately, very few uh, in the water and wastewater space have been properly trained to understand that every centrifugal pump that you operate is exactly the same. It's got red lines. As a matter of fact, centrifugal pumps have two red lines, one on the right side and one on the left side of this very narrow band called the preferred operating range, which straddles the best efficiency point or BEP. And uh, just like your car, bad things happen when you red line pumps. You go too far to the right of this operating range. First of all, your efficiency is going to plummet, but so also is your mechanical reliability. And so you're going to run into issues like cavitation, premature seal failure, premature bearing failure when you're operating in this red zone. And same thing on the left side of the curve. If, uh, if you operate beyond this red zone, you're going to see too much vibration. Uh, there's another form of cavitation called recirculation. In extreme cases, you might be running your pump at what we would call shutoff head, which is essentially where all of the energy that's going into that pump is either being converted to heat or to damage on your impeller. And unfortunately, that's why Smith Pump pulls out so many impellers that look like this, is uh, operators haven't been given the training that they need to understand where they're operating, nor the tool to see where they're operating in real time. 
And unfortunately, that's why we find that this is the norm and not the exception. Uh, Christopher was talking a bit about VFDs, and you have to be careful with VFDs. They're not the panacea or the magic pill that unfortunately some, uh, some have purported them to be. You need to know what you're doing with them. This is a large pump station down in the Houston area that had four pumps on constant speed and two on VFD. And, and they finally admitted that they were kind of using the VFD like a dimmer switch and uh, just turning them down to the point where these pumps were operating outside of preferred operating range 61% of the time. And it's, you can't really tell it from this, but 15% of these data points are stacked up on the axis here, operating at shutoff head not because somebody closed a valve on them, but they simply turned the VFD down to the point where that pump is producing head and it's consuming energy, but it's not producing enough head to make any flow happen. So all of that energy again is just going into destroying these pumps. Even if you were well-trained in hydraulics, unfortunately we often rely on manufacturer's curves to know how we're operating. And the unfortunate reality is, especially in wastewater, and raw water where you're pumping abrasives and things that eat up those impellers, that manufacturer's curve is probably only good on the day that you put it in there because they begin wearing and tearing predictably down and to the left as you're essentially trimming those impellers. And the unfortunate thing is if you're not monitoring power, the preferred operating range doesn't predictably move down and to the left. Sometimes it moves parallel, sometimes it actually moves down and to the right. And so you may be inadvertently operating in a very unhealthy place on the curve after a couple of years and making the, uh, the wear and tear on these impellers uh, move that much faster. Now, mostly that has to do with dynamic pump optimizer and trying to optimize, but there's a whole nother class of pump stations that are out there that are the smaller developer driven pump stations. They tend to be out of sight, out of mind. Most of the time, as a matter of fact, we try to make them out of sight and out of mind. We hide them behind screen walls and we put them in places where hopefully people aren't going to be messing with them too much. And that's all fine and good when they're working properly, they work properly, right? Well, what happens when they're not working properly? Unfortunately, we have a constituency and a customer base now that all have cell phones and uh, it's bad when they show an overflow. It's even worse when they show that overflow going into the creek. It's even worse when they call out your director by name and show the lift station on their Facebook Live, but then it gets even worse when they then post on there and talk about people uh, using substandard materials and substandard services. I blocked out the names to protect both the guilty and the innocent in this one. And the unfortunate reality is in this case, this, this customer is actually the guilty party because almost everything she says in this is incorrect, but uh, the damage is kind of done once it hits uh, the, the, the media and once it goes out there into cyberspace. She mentions that they're refusing to address the issue. And I happen to know this system very, very well, and she's incorrect. The operators did what they could to address this issue. This was the original design of this pump station and the operating point here is right where it's supposed to be within preferred operating range. That's going through a 14 inch force main. Well, there was a parallel uh, 18 inch force main that was installed for the future and the operators realized that if they turned on the 18 inch force main, they could get more flow. And then they realized if they opened the 14 and the 18 together, they could get even more flow, but look how far outside of preferred operating range they are. What they were really after was the ability to turn on all three sets of pumps and really get a lot of flow out of this station. Unfortunately, that's not what occurs most of the time. Most of the time what occurs is this station was running at full speed, way outside of preferred operating range, and that's why these impellers look like this. This is the uh, biggest impeller that Gorman Rupp makes. There should be a whole lot more metal here. There's not, and these impellers are only one year old. So this is the impact of running a pump this far outside of preferred operating range in just one year. These operators were very surprised when they replaced these impellers and all of a sudden they were getting twice as much flow out of each pump. Well, they shouldn't have been. That's what they were designed to do when they had all of their metal associated with them. Now, unfortunately, the flow meter, the mag meter that was on the discharge of this pump station had been broken for years, but luckily the influent meter uh, that they were using to monitor infiltration and inflow was still working. 
If you take that data and plot it out with an exceedance probability, what you see here is that these peak flows that we're designing these lift stations to handle, in this particular case, are only happening about 4% of the time. 96% of the time, the flow that's coming into this particular pump station is exactly where you would want it to be for this size pump if it was operated on a VFD and operated at minimum specific energy you could have saved, in this case, 40% energy and kept these pumps from wearing out too fast. But unfortunately, they operate right here 100% of the time. And so uh, they're in the process right now of putting VFDs on the station, putting our, our, our products on here so that they can operate correctly 96% of the time and that 4% of the time when the floodgates open, uh, then, then run the station as you need to to prevent an SSO. Now, if you have a station that is able to read flow, there's a lot of interesting things that you can do on there. And so this is one of our customers with a lift station guardian up in, uh, in the Denton area of Texas. And because we're monitoring flow and pressure for this station, we can go and reconfirm the hydraulics for the station. And in this case, I didn't even have to adjust C factors. I didn't have to look at anything. You see that the flow data that's being generated by the lift station guardian is exactly what we would predict for uh, those hydraulics. But what you also see is that the station is not producing uh, what we would expect in terms of flow. That's because of the wear and tear that these impellers have experienced over time. And you see that when we adjust the impeller to what we're actually seeing and compare it to the manufacturer's curve, this pump in about five years has lost about 30% of its potential capacity. And uh, if any of you know Mustang, they are experiencing some unbelievable growth up there. For the last five years, they've grown at about 22% per year. And uh, so this is definitely something to keep an eye on. You don't wanna be growing at 22% per year and have your pump stations producing 30% less flow. That's a recipe for disaster, unfortunately. So this is another thing that you can track and react to with the lift station guardian. Now, what if you don't have a flow meter or what if your flow meter is broken like my, my customer here in Tennessee? We find that that has, is actually a pretty common scenario. These flow meters are expensive. They're kind of tough to maintain and finicky. And the first time they get hit by lightning or flooded, they break and people don't replace them. Well, that's okay because the Lift Station Guardian has a really cool inherent feature in that we convert your level readings into flow readings. And I know there's a couple of other people that do it, but uh, we're doing it better. I kind of forgot to mention that, but Christopher's presentation kind of presented these technologies as good, better, best. And we think that we're best of the best, and hopefully you agree. But hopefully this sawtooth pattern looks familiar to you. Uh, I know there's a lot of engineers on the presentation today. I hope every one of you uh, was forced to go out at some point with a tape measure and a float and a, and a stopwatch to try and convert this into a flow reading. I was a consulting engineer for 24 years. First couple of years I had to do it. It's miserable, but it's a rite of passage. Now what specific energy does is, is far more complex. Uh, we're using one of those submersible pressure transducers that, that uh, Christopher was talking about earlier. But we're a data analytics company, and so we take the data generated over hundreds and hundreds of fill cycles and determine if there's any sort of repeatable pattern to that data. We look at it across a couple of different months, again, to make sure it's repeatable. But then we strap it across your record drawings, and usually we find some really interesting things. For the size uh, manhole, I would have assumed, since it's a cylinder, that it had 206 gallons per foot, and that's how I would have run my calculations. But I would have been wrong. Uh, once I get up to this level, you can see that there's a decrease in the capacity per foot. That's because of the scum and the fog and all those other nasty things that are hanging on the wall of this lift station near the air water interface. And that's another reason for that snoring and scouring cycle is to try and move that around so that you don't get fat bergs and things like that growing in your wet well. But look at this, there's a, a big increase in capacity right here. And it's due to a 20 foot stick of, of eight inch pipe that was stubbed out for a future connection. There's some storage associated with that. And then when you submerge the influent line, you see there's a tremendous amount of storage back in that line. And I know TCEQ doesn't really want you to do that, but sometimes you need to be able to take advantage of that storage. And if you're deep enough, then, uh, then that might be thing, the thing to do. 
from this point, what we're then doing is calculating the change in volume over change in time or DVDT and turning that into a flow reading. And at this point, I thought I'd take you on a quick uh, ride through a couple of our sites that are running right now. This, this is the interface for the Lift Station Guardian. Oh, let's go to Gregory. Gregory just happens to be running right now. You can see the wet well level is dropping. There's about 100 gallons a minute coming into the station. There's about 230 gallons a minute going out of the station. I can look at the pump curve itself and see that we're operating exactly where we need to be on the curve right there. I can bring in as much as a month's worth of data. And again, you see that the pump is operating exactly where we would expect it. Whoops, I did not mean to click that button. Let me go back to Gregory. And uh, that's exactly where we would expect it to operate. One thing that you notice here is the flow reading. So we're, we're, we're tracking the wet well level, but also the flow. You can see that the two pumps here are producing different amounts of flow. If you have two identical pumps in there, then that might be an indication that something is going on with this pump. In this case, that's not what's going on. It turns out that they have two different pumps with two different horsepower and two different characteristic curves that are operating in there. You can see the pump two just turned off, but both of the pumps are operating where they're supposed to be within their curve, just on the edge of preferred operating range. And so that's, that's a very good thing for this system. We also are able to go in and pull this data into things that, uh, that your engineers may want to be able to track and react to over time. You might wanna pull all of this data out for capital improvement plannings. It's very simple to go in and analyze this data to then export the data. Essentially any of the tags that we're monitoring in the system can be added and uh, monitored so that you can use these for capital improvement planning, you can use these for troubleshooting, uh, can be used as you need. Uh, we were talking, uh, Christopher was talking about the snoring cycles and those can be programmed into the system very, very easily uh, where you can go into the control function for these and set where those levels are occurring. You can put exercise functions in there to run them at certain times. You can set where the delays are. You can set essentially everything so that all of those cycles that Christopher uh, was talking about could be set remotely uh, by your operations managers or your operators if you give them permission. You can track these things. The reality is there's different wet well levels that you may need at different times depending upon whether there's storm events rolling into town. And so this is all very configurable uh, it can be set up that you can make these changes on the fly from any computer that has internet access or from your cell phone uh, or tablet or whatever else you need. Uh, Christopher was talking about alarming on some of the things. We're able very easily to go in and essentially any of the tags that we're monitoring, we can also enable alarms for those things. They can be sent out either through the interface or they can be sent out through SMS text messaging. You can configure all of this so that the operators that are uh, on shift only get the alarms when they're on shift. You can have other people that are getting them 24-7. Uh, so you can have a high level alarm that goes out to whoever's on shift at that point. If he doesn't respond and the level gets to high, high alarm, perhaps you want to alarm everybody on staff because somebody needs to get out to this station and see what's going on. Kind of the last thing that I wanted to show you on the interface is the ability to go back in time and essentially access any of the data. Our interface is ridiculously quick at letting you zoom in to any period of time that you want, access, and then uh, export that data out. I wanted to show something, another great feature of the LiftStation Guardian is just giving the situational awareness that's needed during emergency events. And I know you all unfortunately remember what happened about three months ago with the big freeze. Our system was critical to our customers that have this in being able to watch wet well levels. Unfortunately, what you're seeing there is ERCOT cut the power somewhere right around here. The wet well level started climbing, the power would come on and the wet wells would do what they were supposed to. Over the next uh, several days, essentially Mustang was, was watching each of these sites on their phones. When the power came back uh, or the ones that had UPS power, they could sit and watch those wet well levels. In this case, they know they've got about 25 foot is the max wet well level. Before there was an SSO, and you see that in every single case here, they were able to get the power back on before uh, they reached that SSO level, or they had temporary, uh, excuse me, portable 
uh, pumps on trailers that they were able to haul out here. And if they knew they were getting close to that level and they didn't have power, they could prioritize the emergency assets, either the generators or the portable pumps that they had to make sure that these uh, wet wells were appropriately pumped down. And then thank God the power came back on and you could see things returned back to some sense of normalcy for them somewhere around February the 17th. Well, uh, there was one last thing I wanted to show you is these pump station report cards are generated every month. They give you some vital information about what's going on at the station, whether starts and run times are increasing. If there's pumps that are getting too close to their issue and they're having trouble meeting demand, you'll get a report card on that. You can see what the flows look like between the two pumps. Again, if these were identical sized pumps, I'd be concerned about this right now. But uh, as they're two different sized pumps, that's fully appropriate. But all of the information that you need to make good asset management decisions is automatically generated for you and contained within these uh, report cards. And if there's something you don't see that you do want tracked in there, the great thing is uh, we'd be happy to work with you and configure these reports to your specific needs. One last thing I wanted to show you is we've just added a dashboard feature to our HMI where you can create your own customizable dashboards. I made this one just to sort of show that you could bring all of your lift station guardians into one screen where you can see both the inflow, the outflow, the, the wet well levels in each of these stations. If you see that one of the pumps is running a little too low, again, Gregory's starting to get outside of that, that boundary where the wear and tear may be a bit concerning. You can quickly jump over and take a look. Uh, we also talked about spinning the pumps backward. If, we, if we're given the, you can see the amps here, and so we're monitoring power on these as well. And if we see any indication of uh, ragging on the, on, the, uh, on the suction side of the pump as well, we can trigger that VFD to spin backwards as Christopher was mentioning about. So that ability to take rags and debris and sometimes even grease off the inlet side or the suction side of your pump is baked into what the lift station guardian does as well. Uh, going back to that interface, I think I covered everything that I needed to at this point. I'll go back to PowerPoint for just a moment here. Whoops. So again, just in summary, the ability to react, the ability to have alarms, to have dashboards that keep uh, all of these stations that are out of sight, out of mind, where they need to be. The ability to predict, oh, I forgot to even mention air binding, but over and over again, we're seeing issues with air binding in, in wastewater force mains and uh, the ability to predict those things and give you the information you need to, uh, to know when that's occurring in your system is just vital. The ability to see all of your lift stations and jump in there uh, change set points if you need. One, to prevent sediment buildup at the, the snoring and scouring program, uh, the ability to reduce ragging, the ability to reduce fat birds. Uh, the unfortunate reality is uh, maintaining your pump station at a constant level is probably not the best way to, present, to prevent these fat birds. And so we think we've got a better operational structure there uh, that, that's baked into the low station guardian. Uh, we mentioned the asset management reports and the ability to keep track of these things for when uh, the EPA comes and knock and you can show that you're doing everything within your pump station uh, asset management plan and capacity assurance plan to assure that these pump stations are able to do what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, we've made it as easy as possible. So we have a reference spec that, uh, that can be sent out with your lift station packages. It's very easy uh, to configure the lift station guardian. We uh, love working with panel builders and, and Smith Pump has a great panel shop, as Christopher mentioned. They can incorporate this lift station uh, guardian template into the panel that they're building for you to make sure that we've got it built to your specifications and our specifications to make sure that this thing is going to be uh, to meet your needs and be easy to use for the foreseeable future. And last of all, we don't want you to take our advice for it. Please call all those Samara up at Mustang, a uh, big advocate for what we're doing here. They are now up to, I believe, I believe it's 28 lift station guardians in the Mustang system. As I mentioned, they're growing so unbelievably rapidly. I think we've commissioned 15 new lift station guardians for them just in the last year. And uh, it's revolutionized. They're, they're unfortunately adding customers faster than they can add staff. And so the ability to see all of this in the palm of your hand in every single computer to distribute that data out to your personnel 
so that the right people get the right information at the right time has been critical to them. And uh, again, please call our references. We would love to set that up for you. Thank you so much for your time. I look forward to working with Smith Pump and all of you. Have a great day. Yes, thanks for attending.